So now you have learned about phase clustering and you have learned about phase lag based synchronization measures. When should you use phase lag and when should you use phase clustering? That is the main goal of this video. I'm going to show you that these are actually not the same thing. You can get different answers, different results from using these two methods on the same data. And then I will have a brief discussion about the advantages and limitations of each of these methods because not, neither of these methods is perfect. And that will lead to a discussion of when you should prefer using phase lag based measures and when you should prefer using phase clustering based measures for looking at electrophysiological connectivity. So let me start with a very simple simulation. What I've done here is generate two distributions of phase angles and then rotated them. So these two distributions are exactly the same, just with a, uh, a, a you know a whole rotation of pi over two, so a 90 degree rotation. Likewise, these two distributions are exactly the same, they are just rotated. Now, because ISPC, intersite phase clustering, measures the overall clustering, the uh, ISPC is high for these two cases, very close to one, and it's lower for these two cases, also you know, still a respectable strength of clustering, but lower than here, and it's 0.64 in both of these cases. Now that is not surprising because this is a measure of the clustering of phase angles and the clustering of phase angles is exactly the same in these two cases and in these two cases. However, the PLI is quite different between these two cases. Here is one. And it's one here because, as I've discussed in a previous video, all of these phase angles are pointed up. They have the same um, sign of their projection onto the imaginary axis. So the phase lag index is one here, and it's zero here because half of the phase angles are pointed up and half of them are pointed down on the imaginary axis. And here, both of these distributions have a PLI of exactly one, even though the clustering is quite different. And then here, I have to admit, I was a little bit lazy, and this is one of my biggest life regrets over the past, you know, eight years or whatever, that I didn't rotate this exactly so that the PLI was much closer to zero. It would have been easy for me to get this to be a PLI of zero. But anyway, I hope you can forgive me for that. All right, so this is a fairly simple uh, demonstration showing the dissociation between PLI and phase clustering. What you see here is also a simulation, also simulated data. And what I've done here is take a distribution of phase angles like this, and I rotated them slowly over time. So the distribution, the, the, the strength of the clustering is basically the same, but the distribution is moving around the circle slowly over time. So the clustering here is the same. So of course the ISPC, which is this black line, is the same up to here, I will talk about this part of the simulation in a moment. And what you see here is that the debiased weighted PLI, which is essentially the PLI, it's just like a smoothed version of the PLI. So the PLI drops all the way down to zero, and that happens as this distribution goes past a phase angle of zero here. So as this distribution is sliding up this way, then the PLI dips down to zero when this distribution is such that half of the distribution is below zero and half is above zero. Okay, and then what I started doing at this point, this time point here, is changing the simulation a bit. So now the distribution is actually initially pointing up at pi over two, and then the distribution is getting wider and wider. It's spreading out over time. And then as it spreads out and gets wider, the phase clustering and also the phase lag both go down towards zero, but that happens for very different reasons. In phase clustering, it's getting towards zero because the distribution is going towards a uniform distribution. And you can see here that all of these uh, phase angles and these phase angles are gonna cancel, so the average is going to be a very, very small vector close to the origin. But for uh, PLI, it goes to zero for a different reason, and that's because about half of the vectors are above the real axis and half of the vectors are below the real axis. Okay, so again, a fairly simplistic situation. 
And what I'm going to illustrate to you now is a more detailed simulation that I think really illustrates both the advantages and the limitations of these two methods, phase lag and phase clustering. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this figure. So let me take a few moments to walk you through. What I did in this simulation is generate data inside brain dipoles. So I'm not simulating electrode level activity, but simulating dipole level activity. So I simulate two dipoles. One is near the in the prefrontal cortex and one is in the parietal cortex. And then I projected the activity of those dipoles out onto the EEG electrodes. And then I did all of my analyses at the level of EEG electrodes. Now the two dipoles were synchronized. I generated them to be synchronous at 10 hertz for around a second. So you can already kind of see that here. And then with the EEG channel data, I either applied the average reference or I applied the Laplacian reference, which you already learned about a few videos ago. And then I computed a time frequency analysis of synchronization between FZ, this channel here, and all the other electrodes on the scalp. So the color that you see here is the synchronization strength in the alpha band, which is where I simulated the synchronization in the dipoles. And then here you see electrode PZ. And what you're looking at in these maps here, this is time frequency analysis of synchronization. So this is not showing power. This is showing synchronization between FZ and PZ. So you see it over uh, evolving over time and also over frequency. Okay, and then I repeated all of these analyses using uh, phase clustering and also phase lag index. Now, let me first walk you through panel A, and, or A and C, I guess, this, so the left column, and then in a moment I will talk about what's going on with this thing here. Okay, so I hope that almost everything makes sense. I've explained almost everything. The last thing is about this dotted horizontal line and this solid white line. So this solid light white line here shows the ISPC, or the synchronization, between FZ and PZ at 10 hertz. So that's showing this line here through 10 hertz. And the dotted line corresponds to zero. So it's scaled on this plot. Now, here is what you should see in the data based on how I simulated the data. So remember, I simulated these data, so I know what the ground truth is. So there was no synchronization between the two dipoles before time zero. So before time zero, this uh, this map should be black here. You can see it should be black. In fact, for uh, the phase lag index, it is pretty much black. And here for phase clustering, it's not black. It's maybe, point, it's somewhere you know around 0 0.3, 0 0.4 in that kind of range. And that you also see in this line here. So this line shows the synchronization in the alpha band, so around 10 hertz. And this, the value of the synchronization in the baseline here at 10 hertz is around 0 0.3. That's this y-axis here, uh, label corresponds to the lines. But this really should be at zero. And that you see for PLI, the synchronization pre-stim before time zero is uh, zero. The synchronization strength is zero. So this tells you that if we look before time zero, then the PLI correctly did not find spurious synchronization, whereas the phase clustering actually did uh, find a little bit of spurious synchronization here. It's a little bit lower for the Laplacian compared to the average reference, but it's still certainly greater than zero. Okay, so that's one thing we should see. Another thing we should see based on how I simulated the data is that the synchronization between these two electrodes, which are the closest electrodes to the to where the dipoles projected onto the scalp, the synchronization should be basically one between around, uh, I forget exactly, but I think it was like 200 to 1,000 milliseconds. But it should get up to one here because in the, in the data, in the ground truth data, I simulated perfect synchronization. And so here you see that with phase clustering, we recover basically exactly one. So we are maximally sensitive for identifying a true effect. And here with the PLI, with the phase lag index, we're actually missing some true connectivity. So we still certainly identify this connectivity, but it's reduced. So it's it peaks at around you know, 0.6 or 0.65, somewhere around here. So 
we are a little bit less sensitive for detecting true effects. Now, if you look at the topographical maps, again, what you should see based on how I simulated the data is that most of the map should be black or very dark, and we should just get some light colors here around this electrode PZ. Now, the uh, average reference shows white all over the place here, uh, and so this is really all reflecting volume conducted signal. With the Laplacian, it's pretty interesting. You see that there is still some volume conduction artifacts in the near neighborhood of the seed electrode. So this is all volume conduction artifacts. However, it's very spatially restricted to uh, pretty much just a ring around the seed electrode. Once you get more than like one electrode away, then uh, all of a sudden the synchronization drops very small, it becomes very weak, and then we get a bright spot of synchronization again. So this is spurious due to volume conduction. This reflects the true signal here. And you can see when you look at the uh, PLI that it's all dark, it's close to zero around the seed electrode, which means that the PLI did not identify this as spurious connectivity, which is great. And the PLI also looks a little bit better after the Laplacian, although you don't actually need the spatial filter for the PLI the way that you do for phase clustering. So, uh, so some features look pretty good and some features, so some features, some aspects of these results look good for the PLI, some aspects don't look very good for the PLI, and some aspects look good for phase clustering and other aspects don't look so good for phase clustering. So these measures are different, neither is perfect. Okay, so that's all of the left panel. What you see on the right panel is essentially the same thing, except I simulate, I generated the simulation a little bit different. And in particular, what I did here is the dipole signals were just pure sine waves, which is not very physiological. The dipole signals were pure sine waves here. And here, what I did was simulate dipoles that have some noise in the frequency. So the average frequency was 10 Hertz here. So that part's very similar but the frequency of the signal could change very slightly over time. And these very, very small frequency fluctuations in the signal are first of all reflective of what physiological activity really looks like, that it's not a pure constant sine wave. The exact frequency can vary slightly over time. But that also simulates this kind of situation here because when you have synchronization between two oscillators that are similar in frequency but not perfectly, perfectly, exactly frequency matched, you will get the phase angle distribution to spin slowly around the circle, and the speed at which it goes around the circle depends on the relative frequencies. So for example, if you have one oscillator that's at 10 hertz and another oscillator that's at 10.1 hertz, and if they are synchronized oscillators, then the phase angle difference will move very, very slowly at 0.1 hertz. So essentially, this was just slightly more physiologically plausible data. And now you can see that the synchronization, the estimated synchronization from phase clustering was weaker, but still definitely present. Whereas for phase lag, it was unfortunately totally obliterated. And we just failed to identify the true synchronization, which was really there. I know that it was there because I simulated it. I created these data. So Again, we see some good things and some bad things about both of these methods. So now let me summarize a little bit the advantages and disadvantages of phase lag and phase clustering. And again, these advantages and disadvantages that I will list here refer to uh, or are, are relevant for all of the phase lag based synchronization measures, not just the PLI. So the PLI, uh, so these all of these phase lag based measures can miss true connectivity values when they are there because they have reduced sensitivity. And phase clustering is maximally sensitive to detecting potentially small, subtle effects. So that's good for phase clustering, not so good for phase lag. On the other hand, phase lag index has no confound of volume connection. So you never need to be concerned about whether your results are spurious or inflated because of volume connection. And with phase clustering, of course, you do get the potential for a volume conduction artifact. Of course, that doesn't mean that all of your positive results from phase clustering are 
artifacts or are inflated because of volume conduction, but it does mean that if you're using phase lag based measures, you don't even need to think about this confound. And if you're using phase clustering, you always need to at least be a little bit concerned about whether there is some potential for inflation. Okay, so based on these advantages and limitations, my recommendation is to use phase lag based measures for exploratory analyses and use phase clustering methods for hypothesis driven analyses. So why is that? Why do I make this recommendation? Well, this really has to do with the number of tests that you are running overall. In general, when people do exploratory analyses, they tend to do lots and lots and lots of tests. So for example, you might have 64 EEG channels and you're going to be computing synchronization across all possible pairs of channels. That is a ton of analyses. That's a lot of data that you're going to get. You want to be confident that none of your analyses are confound, are artifactual because of volume conduction. And you have to be willing to um, accept that you are going to potentially miss some true effects. In order, That's the sacrifice you make in order to have thousands of results without having to worry about volume conduction. On the other hand, when people are doing hypothesis-driven analyses, they tend to do a relatively small number of analyses because you know, your theory, the theory that you're working with, might predict that you really only need to look at a few critical results. So if you only have a relatively small number of analyses, you want to have maximal sensitivity to detect effects that might be subtle and if you only have a couple of results, if you only have a couple of analyses that you're looking at, then it's, it's much more feasible to be able to look through each result carefully and methodically and determine whether volume conduction might be contributing to that result. Now, you could, of course, combine these as well. So, for example, you could do exploratory analyses with phase clustering that will give you maximal sensitivity, and then when you find some interesting results, you can interrogate those results further by applying phase lag based measures to these things, to the results you get here, and that will tell you whether they are volume conducted artifacts. Anyway, the main goal of this video was to illustrate to you that phase lag based measures and phase clustering for synchronization are both really powerful methods for synchronization and they each have their own sets of advantages and limitations. And it's important to think carefully about which measure is more appropriate for your particular application.